Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this new meeting of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. We are speaking today of uh, uh, reproduction and in particular of ART practice during the COVID pandemic. Uh, our speakers today will be Professor Basil Tarlatsis and Professor Pedro Barri. And uh, our chair, as usually, will be Professor Andrea Genazzani. Uh, Professor Barry, at present, is the director of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproduction of the Institute Universitario de Exeus. And from January 2011, he is the director of the chair of the investigation in obstetrics and gynecology of the Institute Universitario de Exeus of the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. Professor Barry has been member and chair of uh, several international uh, scientific societies and he is also <coughs> now member of the board of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. Professor Tarlatsis is Professor Emeritus in Obstetrics and Gynecology and Human Reproduction at the Aristotelian University of Thessaloniki in Greece. He is uh, President-elect of EBCOG. Eb past president of ESHRE, past president of the International Federation of Fertility Societies, and he is also a member of the ISG board. Professor Andrea Genazzani is a professor of gynecology as well as scientific and medical research in many fields, including endocrinology, embryology, and fertility, with numerous publications and books, and he is the president of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. Professor Genazzani, please, if you can chair this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to go on in the session. And as you have seen, ISGEs also take care of what happened in the world. And uh, nothing is more evident now than the COVID pandemic. And certainly, as is the reproductive technology and also obstetrics have strongly suffered and were obliged to face the situation and to see how to go <clears throat> and how we can proceed and how to manage. And it's my pleasure now to ask uh, Professor Basil Tarlatsis to start uh, with uh, uh, your presentation, which will be more devoted to ART, to assisted reproductive technologies in COVID pandemia. Thank you, Andrea. I would like to thank the uh, ISGE and Professor Genazzani for the uh, invitation to participate in this uh, very interesting uh, webinar, which takes place in uh, really challenging times, both for the society, but also for the ART community. So um, these are my disclosures, but uh, none is related to this uh, lecture. So we all know that um, uh, when the uh, pandemic uh, erupted, the, uh, our scientific societies, the relevant scientific societies, ESHRE, ASRM, BSRM, BFS, and so on, they all issued statements. And in view of the unknown, uh, uh, most of them were uh, suggesting to, uh, to start, uh, to stop, uh, treatment of uh, new patients and only finish up uh, the ongoing cycles and also to uh, undertake new cycles only in selected cases, especially uh, cancer patients wishing to preserve uh, fertility. <clears throat> and this is interesting because it shows the ART activity in Europe as of April 2020. And as you can see, uh, this indicates that no activity was, is taking place. So uh, Russia, Turkey, Romania, uh, France, Italy, Switzerland, Belgium, uh, UK, Iceland, Ireland, Spain, they stopped uh, the activities. Uh, uh, then there were some uh, uh, centers doing some activity and then there were uh, 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 centers that started the activity again. And then it's interesting to see the same map as of uh, the 16th of June 2020. And with the exception of um, Sweden and maybe uh, here Albania, as you can see, no, Albania is uh, no information actually. Uh, and the same is for Sweden. Most of Europe 
has restarted uh, doing IVF uh, uh, on, on daily basis. Now, uh, at that time, uh, uh, in, in uh, April of 2020, ESHRE issued uh, guidance uh, uh, on recommending, on recommencing ART treatments. And uh, this uh, same uh, message was also conveyed from the ASRM. And that's how we all restarted our activities. The question is, how do you do that? and what are the measures that have to be taken. And so in the, uh, 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 the guidance, uh, we had guidance from ESHRE on recommencing ART and also from the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. Now, using the, uh, the uh, guidelines of uh, uh, ESHRE, uh, the, the uh, uh, the, the recommendations were divided between patients and also uh, personnel. Now, the, uh, for patients, the, uh, the uh, screening should be done two weeks before commencing uh, treatment, and it this consisted of the triage questionnaire, uh, and then, depending on the outcome, we would have uh, couples where the patients and partners were asymptomatic and they had a negative uh, triage uh, uh, questioning. Then there were couples uh, that had, uh, um, uh, that the, the, the woman or her partner had mild or non-specific uh, symptoms and the triage was potentially positive. And in that case, Asher recommended uh, uh, testing for COVID using the antibody tests. And, and then uh, they, they, uh, they uh, categorize the situation to uh, scenario one, which is include into treatment. And then scenario number two, which was be open-minded and keep options open. And finally, th those were patients or partners with specific symptoms and a previous COVID-19 test positive. And in that case, those patients were uh, belonging to scenario three, which was exclude from treatment. Going back to the uh, measures for, uh, pa for patients, the first step as uh, also suggested by Yeshe is to do a triage uh, for both partners. And, and also in many places take a temperature as a screening of, um, uh, of the patients. Uh, and the rest I will discuss uh, subsequently. And this is an, uh, um, an example of a triage questionnaire proposed by ESHRE. So what we are practically asking both partners is whether they have been sick in the last couple of weeks, whether they have or have had uh, temperature above 37.5, uh, whether there was coughing, sore throat, a loss of uh, sense of smell or taste, uh, whether they have been in contact with somebody who uh, had those symptoms or who was diagnosed with uh, COVID, whether they have traveled to an area at high risk for COVID-19 nationally or internationally, whether they work in a hospital or nursing home or healthcare facility uh, and so on and so forth. So these are questions that might uh, identify uh, people who might be at higher risk of being COVID uh, positive. Then <clears throat> we go to the big issue of laboratory testing. And as we know, there are uh, two big categories of tests. One uh, category are the uh, molecular tests, and the most uh, popular one is the uh, RT-PCR uh, for the uh, for the virus. And the second one is the antigen detection, which uh, is quite rapid, rapid and uh, has been tested. And then a second category are the serology uh, antibody testing. Uh, that means testing for uh, IgG and IgM antibodies. Now, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about the antibody tests, and there is a very, uh, a very nice uh, commentary concerning those tests in uh, the, uh, 
Uh, it is online from the JARG uh, uh, journal uh, 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 just this month. And this is uh, the um, table indicating the, uh, the temporal sensitivity. That means the sensitivity uh, as it changes with time, and time means days after the uh, onset of symptoms, and the overall specificity of uh, several commercially available uh, uh, tests uh, as, as provided by the manufacturers. And so as we can see here, and it's very clear that uh, you need, in order to achieve high uh, sensitivity uh, values, it is important to uh, leave several days between the onset of symptoms and uh, the development of, of the uh, antibodies. Otherwise, you, we may have false uh, negative uh, results. And, uh, and, and then, of course, the, uh, uh, as we can see, the specificity is pretty high, over 90% for, uh, uh, for most of those uh, uh, assays. And yeah, and, and, and so if we look at the strengths and limitations of those antibody testings, so the, 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 the positive things are that they, are, uh, uh, they uh, can identify posy-symptomatic and recovered subjects. Uh, they have a good diagnostic performance after seven to 10 days from the onset of symptoms, and it's lower for the so-called rapid assays. They are easy and uh, safe, cheap and short time to results, possible correlation of antibody titers with the severity of the symptom uh, of the syndrome. And we know now that um, uh, this uh, seems to be the case. That means that the asymptomatic patients uh, seem to have a lower uh, uh, titer uh, of antibodies uh, and also possibly a lower uh, viral load. Uh, <clears throat> uh, useful for vaccine seroconversion uh, confirmation. So when the uh, vaccine hopefully is, is available, then we may be able to um, monitor uh, the effect of the vaccine in terms of um, antibody levels. Improve the detection of COVID positive rate in suspected subjects when combined with molecular tests. Easy monitoring of healthy close contacts of infected patients, and also uh, to verify the immune response in a studied uh, population. Now, the limitations are that there is interperson variability in seroconversion, and that seems to be confirmed from different studies. False negative tests are possible and, and pose a challenge, particularly due to temporal. Uh, nature of uh, seroconversion, lack of independent validation of available tests in immunocompromised populations, rapid, uh, rapid tests have, the, uh, have low sensitivity, scarce information on the persistence of antibodies after the first infection, very scarce information on the strength and long-term implication of immunity, lack of robust diagnostic accuracy tests, and limitation in the test harmonization, and so on. So <clears throat> there are differences, and as we all know, there is no um, paradise on earth. So everything has uh, advantages and disadvantages. Can I have the next slide, please? Because again, for some reason, I cannot change it. I don't know what happens, why it gets stuck. If you try to click on the white surface. You mean yeah. here? No, no. Yes. Yeah. Now, that was the previous one. No? Okay. Now then the question comes, if we go to testing is, when do we test? At the beginning of the cycle, before our site pickup, both. And again, there are different uh, uh, strategies as, and recommendations, as we will see. Uh, but uh, at least in, in our country, 
what has been adopted is there is a recommendation to do uh, a, a molecular test before starting ovarian stimulation and repeat and then it's mandatory to repeat that uh, prior to oocyte pickup uh, which would then cover the approximately next three four days for the embryo transfer period as well. <clears throat> so if we can summarize concerning the test because that's an important issue uh, there is no role for uh, antibody testing in the diagnosis of COVID in, in its very early, uh, uh, in its very early uh, phase. The combined use of molecular antibody testing markedly improves the sensitivity of pathogenic diagnosis for COVID patients in the different phases of their infection. For antibody testing, it is recommended to use the automated and um, scalable immunoassays from established manufacturers with complete and clear technical data, uh, data sheet, a regulatory uh, certification by health authorities and evidence of independence, independent validation. Uh, now, if we go to the treatment procedures per se, Specific information, informed consent has to be signed by the patients about the known and unknown risks of COVID infection. And the primary indication, especially in the early days when we started, was cancer patients in uh, oocyte cryopreservation, advanced reproductive age, reduced ovarian follicular reserve, uh, and all the other usual indications lower in priority and a big caution for oocyte donation, especially the, this involves the oocyte donor, a third person, and surrogacy, again, because it involves a third person, the surrogate. And also information, personal protective um, measures or equipment, people call it different names, PPM, I call it. Now, uh, also caution on FSH dosage. I think it is important to avoid OHSS, during monitoring uh, uh, protective measures for patients and staff, um, which include masks, face shields, antiseptics, gloves, etc., less frequent visit to the clinic, we have to limit that, and also social distancing. Now, concerning uh, the uh, oocyte pickup, protection measures for the anesthetist, because of course they are. Uh, on the face of the patient, the patient herself, the staff, and in the recovery, again, keep distances, the minimum time necessary to keep the patient there <clears throat> and avoid too many relatives uh, uh, close to her. Bigger time space between pickups and transfers to give time to uh, nurses for disinfection uh, of the operating uh, room. Now for the uh, uh, treatment procedures, in asymptomatic patients of low risk, uh, that uh, in the early days was freeze all um, uh, embryos. Uh, in in, in, in uh, asymptomatic patients, then we do now embryo transfers for symptomatic or suspicious or positive, then we freeze all embryos. And uh, it is recommended to uh, be in contact with the patient and follow her up by phone or mail uh, for the three weeks after oocyte pickup and embryo transfer for de possibly developing the disease. Now we go to come to the staff. Again, the same scheme by proposed by ESHRE, triage questionnaire. Uh, if it is negative, uh, uh, be uh, in a, uh, work. If it is uh, uh, suspicious or unclear, then do the COVID antibody testing. And if there is a positive, then of course, um, uh, uh, take care of that. Now for the, sta for the staff, again, triage if, uh, is necessary. Temperature, laboratory testing, again, the same things like for patients. And pay, uh, personal protective uh, measures, uh, information on uh, PPM for the patients, COVID specific training and operating procedures have to be developed, the least necessary stuff for embryo transfer, work in small groups 
all the staff, administration staff, nurses, embryologists, doctors that do not have, so that they, these groups do not have contacts between themselves. So in case that this, one of the groups comes in contact with a positive patient, the center doesn't need to close down uh, in total, but this group can go on quarantine. Uh, personal protection measures, um, principles of good laboratory practice adopted for the uh, COVID uh, situation, and special caution on handling the biological materials, especially, especially serum, uh, follicular fluid, semen, and so on. Cryopreservation in safety straws and in special tanks only for COVID uh, patients. And here is the scheme uh, proposed by ESRE, the total uh, scheme. So the triage questionnaire, we said about those three categories of patients, uh, 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 antibody testing, and scenario one would be include, which means again, triage, standard procedure, and then continue. And the other one, depending whether the test is uh, positive or negative, uh, continue or uh, stop treatment, postpone treatment, which is also the case for the sick patients. So, now, so uh, it, become, it became clear that ASRM and ESRI have adopted a, a, a different approach when dealing with tests. So ASRM in their latest June 8 uh, confirmed also in July um, uh, recommendation, they say that there is no sufficient information to recommend specific algorithms uh, for uh, or testing. Molecular tests are still the cornerstone for the diagnosis and should be used preoperatively. Rapid test, tests are inaccurate. Antibody tests have considerable performance variability. Uh, uh, personal protective measures are still the most important uh, step. Uh, whereas Escher in their May 5, uh, 2020 statement, which has not been revised, they, they rec their recommendations depend very much, as I already showed you, on serological testing uh, two weeks before treatment and then during ovarian stimulation in order to decide whether to start treatment and whether to continue treatment uh, respectively. However, irrespective of those, uh, uh, those minor, I would say, or scientific uh, uh, disagreements, I think it is important that the uh, major societies, ASRM, ESRE, and IFFS, together they issued a statement published in the main uh, journals, uh, Human Reproduction, Fertil Steril, uh, and, uh, uh, reproduc and, and also Global Reproduction from IFFS, a, a statement saying that COVID-19 pandemic presents <coughs> a unique global challenge uh, uh, on a, a, a on a scale not previous, previously seen. The in, uh, uh, infectivity and mortality rates are higher than previous pandemics, and the disease is present in almost every country. In this document, ESRE, uh, ASRM, ESRE, and the IFFS have uh, uh, put together, the joint forces in, come together to jointly affirm the importance for continued to reproductive care during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I think that's the end of my presentation and I would like to thank everybody for uh, your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Basil. It's my, it's, I, I would like, first of all, to remind to everybody that you can write your question in the question and answer. You can see on the right side the question and answer corner. Each uh, people participating can write a question that we will use the question after in the discussion time. And then it's my pleasure to give to Pedro Barri the microphone. Mm -hmm. He will speak about the other part. We have the AST before, and then we have hopefully the pregnancy, and then how to face the pregnancy. Please, Pedro. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you to the International Society of Gynecological and Endocrinology for taking the responsibility of organizing these interesting webinars, keeping all uh, our scientific community active during this uh, difficult time of uh, COVID pandemic. I have nothing uh, specific to disclose and uh, my topic uh, will be 
how can we manage with uh, pregnant patients during this uh, period of uh, COVID pandemic. The outline of my talk, I will cover uh, some aspects of, uh, very basic aspects of epidemiology. We will discuss on the clinical symptoms of this patient, the screening that we have to propose, the treatment that can be applied to these uh, pregnant uh, patients with uh, COVID uh, infection, which are the, the obstetrical and perinatal results. And then uh, also for the discussion, we will present some data on the risk of vertical transmission. We uh, are facing a, a viral uh, pandemic, which is in some way similar to the previous experiences with SARS and MERS that were not, were not so global like uh, COVID is, but uh, they, they have, as we will see later on, some uh, similarities. Uh, with COVID, uh, it, in this uh, hyper-connected world where we live, uh, this, uh, the, 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 the spread of the infection has been uh, very, very rapid. And uh, this is a real challenge to face some uh, pathology, which is really global and is also global. The spread of the uh, scientific information by the end of June, I have found uh, 320 PubMed publications uh, dealing with uh, COVID infection and pregnancy. <clears throat> Some epidemiological data, we know that the, uh, the risk of the COVID infection is that the incubation period is short. Uh, the mean time is five days, but it's very important to know that 97% of the infected people will require 10, 12 days to present symptoms. So uh, most of uh, infected people will take for them a week or 10 days. And this is the very risky period in which they can contaminate other people. We know that this is a global uh, pandemic with an, uh, the, you will see that the mortality rate and the figures change every day. Here we have uh, data from uh, uh, two month, uh, May, so it's uh, two months ago, with an overall mortality rate because of COVID of, uh, let's say, 7%, with some disparities between USA, Spain, Italy, Germany, France, UK, etc. Uh, more recently, uh, in June, eh, you can uh, look at the data <clears throat> updated regularly by the John Hopkins, Hopkins University. And uh, in early June, there were 11 million cases, confirmed positive cases for COVID, and half a million deaths, deaths because of COVID. Just very briefly to show the, how fast this uh, pandemic has evolved since December 1st, 29, where uh, was referred the, and recognized the first case of pneumonia of a no cause, later has been identified as COVID-19, uh, and this was uh, recognized in, in uh, China since February 11, where the WHO recognized that there was a novel coronavirus uh, was the responsible for this pandemic, and this uh, pandemic and the virus was called COVID-19. In between, some positive cases have been uh, referred in China, in Thailand, and in, in the USA and in Europe. So uh, in February already, US State Department recommended the people uh, to not to go travel to China. Let's uh, have a look at the, 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 the similarities between COVID and previous viral pandemics uh, like SARS and MERS. Uh, the virus, all of them are beta coronavirus. The, uh, the animal host, in most of the cases, it has been said that there are bats or other animals sold and present in a seafood market in Wuhan, in China. 
the incubation, the incubation period is short, five, as I mean, 5.2 days. Uh, but the time from in, the, the infection to present symptoms uh, is very variable, but it, it can take as long as 10, 11 days. The patient's characteristic is that mainly for all these uh, coronavirus infection uh, affect all people, adults, children are at less uh, uh, reduced risk for being infected. And there is a sex ratio in, in especially for SARS that is uh, a little bit uh, different in favor of male or female. And the, the, the mortality rate at, at in this publication, it was, been, it was estimated for COVID that was 1%, but as we have seen and we will see, uh, it's around 10% when more data have been accumulated. Which are the, the maternal symptoms at the diagnosis of uh, COVID? We have the British data that show that uh, with uh, quite a large sample of 420 uh, pregnant patients infected uh, with COVID, fever, cough, and breathlessness were the most common symptoms. Other symptoms was tiredness, headache, limb or joint pain, sore throat, vomiting, diarrhea, rhinorrhea, and also, as you will see, the loss of uh, smell and taste. If, uh, again, we compare the, the, the clinical uh, symptoms of SARS, MERS, and COVID, mm, they are very similar. Eh? Both uh, the, the three entities present with fever, cough, myalgia, headache, diarrhea, and the laboratory testing uh, show findings which are very, very similar. So, uh, Basil Tarlasis has nicely shown the, 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 the benefits of using questionnaire for triage. And in, in case of a pregnant patient, it is recommended to send uh, the, 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 the medical group, the, the hospital has to send a questionnaire to the patient asking if they have been diagnosed with COVID, if he, they have been exposed, or if they have present some of the symptoms that. I have uh, uh, already mentioned. But the, the clinical symptoms are not a good, uh, the triage is useful, uh, but uh, it has some uh, a good specificity, but the sensitivity is very, um, is, is not good enough. As we can see here uh, in, in a small group of patients, uh, out of 32 positive COVID pregnant patients, 11, this means that uh, were symptomatic, but 21, this is two thirds of the patients were asymptomatic. So uh, I think that the triage for pregnant patients uh, maybe is not enough. Hmm? Uh, which are the, the, the clinical criteria for suggesting a pregnant patient uh, that could be infected by COVID, uh, uh, recommending her to be admitted in a hospital. The recommendations are uh, in case of severe shortness of breath, tachypnea, hypoxia, uh, X-ray or CT scan showing a pneumonia, severe asthma, and serious comorbidities such as cancer, sorry, uh, cancer, HIV infection, etc. And if we look at the laboratory test, the signs that of alert will are uh, elevated um, C-reactive protein, elevated procalcitonin, uh, platelet count below 100,000, elevated prothrombin, and elevated DMRD and liver function test. And how they, uh, which are the, the epidemiological risk factors. We, uh, we have seen uh, in this uh, publication from the British Medical Journal that uh, all pregnant patient age uh, was a risk factor 
And as you can see here, patients over 35 years of age were uh, significantly at a higher risk of uh, presenting a COVID infection, as well as the obese patients, eh? patients overweight and obese patients were uh, at a higher risk. And as far for any distribution, Asian, uh, Black and Chinese patients were also at a higher risk of uh, presenting uh, clinical symptoms of COVID. We have tests during the, the, the most difficult uh, the time of the pandemic from April 15 to June 15 in my department. We have tests by means of uh, immunological ELISA test and or PCR. We have tested 647 pregnant patients and out of them, 21 uh, proved to be positive. This means that 3.34% of our pregnant population uh, uh, end as a positive COVID um, patient. How can we treat a pregnant patient uh, suffering with uh, COVID? The, the list of treatments is well known. We can use antiviral drugs, antimalarials, and you know the, 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 the story of uh, hydrochloroquina, anticoagulants, because in the more we know more data about the physiopathology of the infection, we know that the pregnant patient with COVID at a, are at a higher risk of presenting uh, thromboembolic phenomenon. They can be also treated with the steroids, with antibiotics, with host-directed therapies, metformin, uh, glitazones, with the infusion of convalescent plasma, or with using immunomodulatory agents or interferons. It is very important in these slides that show that the, the infection uh, with COVID has two phases. The first phase that are in the stage one and stage two, <clears throat> there is the viral response phase. And in, during this phase, the most active drugs are antivirals. And it seems that remdesivir is the most active, but other antivirals have also been used. But in the most difficult phase, which is the host inflammatory response phase, is where all the complications occur, other drugs should be used, such as uh, IL uh, interleukin uh, 6 or 1 inhibitors, high doses of immunoglobulins, hyperimmune serum, monoclonal antibodies, and corticoids, dexamethasone. How these uh, pregnant patients infected with COVID uh, uh, evolved? How they, uh, how it was their outcome. Only 10% require uh, critical care uh, and uh, pneumonia was present in, in this population in 24% of the patients. 1% of the patients passed away, 93% uh, were discharged from the hospital well, and 6% at the time of writing this article were still in the hospital. And what happened with the pregnancy outcome? outcome okay? uh, pregnancy was completed in 62% of the cases and was still ongoing in 38%. 97% of the pregnancy completed uh, ended with a live birth, which is good news. 1% of neonatal date. Uh, because doctors uh, were afraid at the time, there was a trend to finish the pregnancy early, and this is why uh, there was a, a rate of prematurity quite high. And the mode of birth uh, strictly related to the pathology of COVID, and the COVID was the cause for performing a cesarean section in 60% of the cases. In 44% of the cases, a cesarean section has been performed, but for other indications not related to COVID. 
and uh, in 41% uh, of the cases, a, a vaginal delivery occurred. And with the babies, what happened with the babies? 25% of the babies were admitted in the neonatal intensive care unit, but only 4% of them showed a positive uh, COVID test at uh, 12 or more than 12 hours of uh, admission in the intensive care, neonatal intensive care unit. Just an example of the, what happened in three patients who died, pregnant patients who died uh, as of March 6th. And here we have the first case, it was a 44 year old patient who presented with cough, headache, chills, etc., with chest imaging showing a bilateral pneumonia. Uh, she had a miscarriage and she died because of a respiratory failure. And the other two were young patients, 34 years of age, 32 and 27 weeks of gestation, the same clinical symptoms, the same bilateral and severe pneumonia. Both had a cesarean section. The babies survived both, but unfortunately the mother died in both cases. Another treatment and uh, clinical strategy to apply for the management of uh, our pregnant and non-pregnant uh, uh, gynecological patients is to adapt our facilities, our clinical facilities to this situation by giving a lot of information, allowing only two people in the elevator at the same time, showing uh, in the waiting uh, rooms, leaving one seat, free between the two patients, uh, suggesting uh, the people waiting outside the, the, the hospital, and we have placed some seats all around the, the, the atrium of our hospital, and inside placing some uh, very clear bands, uh, um, giving the, 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 the feeling to the patient that they have to take care to keep a social distance and to, of course, to wear masks, etc. How uh, um, they, the healthcare workers have to protect themselves, uh, and uh, Basil have uh, very nice show that the benefits of using PPEs, and I think that we should recommend the 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 the, the PPEs according to the risk category of the patients for low risk patients, according to the triage, for example, uh, a standard precaution and surgical mask could be enough. With patients with moderate risk, we should wear a surgical cap, gloves, uh, face shield or goggles, gown and surgical mask. And for high risk uh, patients, we have all ex uh, used more uh, strict uh, um, equipment. It is very important also to suggest uh, the, the patients and their families to follow a visit, a specific uh, policy of visiting the patient. Uh, no additional family or friend should be allowed in any outpatient appointment. Patients are asked not to bring children. And if uh, people arriving at the front desk uh, check in, uh, presenting with uh, symptoms, they have to be sent back home and they are not allowed to get in uh, our facilities. And uh, patients can be, uh, can be um, uh, rescheduled for, in case of non-urgent care, for another day. In, uh, we, for the management of this patient, it depends on the, 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 the period of the pregnancy in which they are. At the beginning of the patient, uh, it will, uh, there is a, the recommendation is to follow, the recommendation of the Royal College is to have a telephone triage and according to the, the possible risk of uh, COVID-19, if there is a low risk, we can perform an ultrasound scan, it's a high risk, we can delay this ultrasound scan unless the patient present 
clinical symptoms of uh, uh, threatening miscarriage or some uh, risk of ectopic pregnancy. For the management of pregnancies, the recommendation is to alternate virtual and presential uh, in-person visits to the center. And in each visit, it is well established in the different recommendations, which are the tests and the clinical examination that should be performed. And it's very easy in patients, pregnant patients with uh, specific pathologies, uh, which could be the recommendations that we can suggest them to have a safe uh, management and uh, reducing the risk as much as possible. And for the delivery, according to the level of risk of the patient, if, a low, if, if it's a low risk patient, uh, uh, she can be accepted in the routine peripartum care uh, to wear surgical mask, both the patient and the medical team. And uh, in case of moderate risk or high risk, the recommendations will increase the level of, uh, of uh, recommendation for uh, testing with RT-PCR, with uh, using uh, extra measures of PP uh, equipment for protection. And uh, just to conclude, at the beginning of this, uh, the first month or two months, uh, the, the, the message was that there was no vertical transmission from an infected pregnant patient to the baby. Uh, and more recently, more papers uh, have shown that there is a risk of uh, vertical transmission. And uh, there is a, a very recent Italian paper in which they have analyzed 31 pregnant COVID positive patients, and they prove that uh, SARS-CoV-2 was present at the level of placenta, at the vaginal swab, in the umbilical cord, and in the milk of the patient. Uh, despite uh, this presence in the milk, there is still a recommendation of breastfeeding because the, the benefits are higher than the risk that the patient can uh, have and the baby can have even in an infected COVID patient. That's all what I wanted to share with you and I thank you, you all uh, for being with us. And just as take home messages, I will leave uh, some very clear messages. SARS-CoV-2 is a new coronavirus with a high infectivity can cause severe respiratory infection in 20% of the cases, mainly in elderly and in patients with comorbidities. And it is accepted that the overall mortality rate is around 10%. Antiviral and anti-inflammatory drugs must be started early in order to avoid the, the complication of uh, ARDS and mechanical ventilation, in which situation the risk of mortality will raise to 50%. Antiviral activity of uh, hydrochloroquine, lopinavir, is very poor. And it seems that remdesivir is the first antiviral that has shown clinical benefit. Uh, inhibitors of interleukin-1 and 6 are showing promising results, but uh, there are uh, no clinical trials proving their efficacy, and these trials are lacking. And, uh, Case isolation, contact tracing, personal and population prevention by using masks and social distance uh, will be, I hope that they are uh, helpful to contain the epidemic until uh, vaccine study uh, are already started, but the vaccine is not yet available. So this is my final message and I thank you all for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Pedro. If you can... Uh, close your slides. Uh, we will yes. go. We are now in the. Sorry. Great. We are now in the question and answer session. We have received some questions, and then uh, I would like to invite all our people participating to send their question by question and answer. Right. The first question will be for Professor Tarlassis from an, an anonymous uh, uh, follower. What are the reason for false negative? Uh, uh, PCR COVID testing. Thank you, uh, Andrea. Thank you for the question. 
uh, uh, the, um, the main reasons are number one, because of not high enough uh, viral load. That means if the test is done uh, a bit early and the viral load is not high enough, then the test may be negative. The second is uh, technical. Maybe the swab that was taken, uh, was, yes, was not, did not collect enough material in order to provide um, a reliable uh, test, a reliable answer. And that's why the, uh, the current wisdom is that if we, uh, uh, we, or if it is done too early anyway. So the current no, uh, wisdom is that we do the test and then if it is negative, we have to repeat it after a few days, about, approximately about five or so, to make sure that indeed the, 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 this person is uh, negative. Thank you, thank you very much. Now we have here another question from anonymous attendee for uh, Pedro Barri. And uh, the question is related to the complication of the, the, of the COVID disease. And the question is uh, a strong obstetrical question. Is heparin useful for the management of COVID pregnant patients? Uh, nowadays, uh, heparin has been incorporated in the armamentarium of uh, drugs to be used in, uh, not only in, in uh, pregnant COVID patients, but also in most of uh, COVID patients, male and female COVID patients. Okay, thank you very much. And also for Basil, is another question always related to the test. What type of COVID test and when do you perform in your unit? Um, so in, in, in our unit, and that's uh, also um, in, in Greece, I would say, uh, the recommendation for the moment is to use the RT-PCR test. Uh, the antibody tests are being used only in uh, you know, national health service settings because they want to make sure that they are standardized and, 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 and so they are used for epidemiological purposes, but not for uh, treating, uh, for, for de uh, deciding that the treatment strategy of the patient. So for the, uh, for the uh, moment, we are all doing the RT-PCR tests uh, mainly. Uh, yeah. And so we do it again with the, um, there's a recommendation to do the first test uh, uh, just prior to starting ovarian stimulation and, and repeat it, uh, and this is a recommendation, whereas the second one is kind of uh, mandatory to do it on the day of HCG in order to cover the oocyte pickup and the embryo transfer uh, period. Okay, thank you very much. And then now we will go back to Pedro. Pedro, the question is, uh, uh, which uh, is the best anesthesia for pregnant patients with COVID? Uh, of course, it seems that it's epidural anesthesia mm -hmm. because uh, we, we should avoid uh, intubation and we should avoid uh, the, the, the risk of passing uh, fluid droplets uh, from uh, the, the trachea and the respiratory um, uh, and the, from the lungs of the patient to the personnel, to the anesthesiologist. And this is why epidural anesthesia is the most recommended mm -hmm. anesthesia for pregnant patients. Yes, and then still again for you, another question is related to the, to the type of delivery. We have seen that in the most of the patients, the cesarean section was uh, done either for COVID as well for other reasons. But the question is, is cesarean section mandatory? We have, to, we have some advantage for the pregnant woman or for the children of the, from the cesarean section or also from natural delivery, if everything is going well. What is your believing? Now, if we look at the literature, there is a lot of publications showing the obstetrical results. And it seems that vaginal, vaginal delivery can be proposed safely if the patient is in good condition, although infected, but in good uh, condition. Uh, in case, of course, of a patient with uh, bilateral pneumonia and very severe uh, ARDS uh, syndrome, it's mandatory to perform an emergency cesarean section. But for 
patients which are quite stable, uh, a vaginal delivery can be proposed. Andrea, can I ask a follow-up yes, yes, question please. to that? Pedro, in view of your uh, or, or one of the, your last slides uh, showing that um, uh, that the COVID was identified in the vagina, yeah, do you think that this in the future may alter what you the, you just said? I mean, would it be safer, let's say, for uh, uh, for the baby to do a, a C-section to avoid the uh, transmission, or you still believe that? Uh, vaginal is the best way forward. I, I don't know. What is clear is that the, the initial publication, there were, they said there is no risk of vertical transmission. transmission. Yeah. Babies are born healthy uh, without uh, any problem. Uh, but nowadays we see more publications showing that the positive babies uh, are there born although they do well and they, they recover very well because probably the, their immunologic uh, equilibrium is uh, much better than the adults. Uh, but I think that the risk um, is there and maybe we have to wait for uh, having more data to say, well, you should ask, like you test for, for a streptococcus or for other that to test uh, with a vaginal swab and in cases of positive, uh, maybe we, sh we should reconsider our uh, strategy. Thank you. With your, with your answer, you have also answered to the question of Miriam Torret. I thank her for her question. Now, Lauren Green asks, uh, Basil, this is for you. Do different countries have different reliability in PCR testing or in SARS uh, uh, testing? Yes, I think it has become apparent that uh, different countries have different availability and also it depends on the resources that are available to buy, but also as we heard during the, uh, the peak of the pandemic, uh, it was not always possible to get hold of these uh, tests and uh, sometimes there were, um, uh, we heard that they were diverted from uh, en route yeah, while they were, the, 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 the material was heading for, let's say, Italy, halfway went somewhere else. So I think, yes, this is true. In, in our country, at least, initially it was exclusively PCR testing. And gradually, as some of the uh, uh, antibody tests uh, uh, had uh, validations, then we obtain uh, these tests. And as I said, they are used now quite ex extensively in the population for epidemiological purposes. But uh, uh, still for uh, patients to be operated and so on, the RT-PCR, I think, is, remains the, the method of choice, the test of choice. Thank you very much. Now is uh, one question from an anonymous attendee, which is a reflection that both of you can answer is do you advise infertile female patient to postpone obtaining pregnancy or do you encourage them to aggressively treat infertility in this COVID-19 era before the time of the appearance of, vac of vaccines? Well, if I can start, because I, I had to, to, to um, struggle with this, um, with this question from the beginning of the crisis, my position was and still is that if we consider and uh, i think pedro gave a beautiful overview of the situation that um, uh, that pregnant women were at higher risk of uh, uh, of getting sick from covid or that in case they got sick they had higher uh, chances of becoming severely sick and if we heard that there was a high risk for fetal malformations and so on, then there should have been a general uh, a man a mandate, people not to get pregnant. And that would have been extremely important when people were staying at home at the lockdowns. So, uh, uh, but this, such a, an advice or a mandate was never issued. So if this is the case for the general population, which means you can have children, why should we sort of punish infertile women who have to defer, whereas we know that in most of our clinics, 
the, the, the biggest proportion of patients are already uh, from um, uh, the reproduction point of view of advanced uh, reproductive age. So I think that uh, as we do for the general population, the same principles should apply for the, uh, uh, for the uh, infertile women. And at, uh, at any point, as always in medicine, we should always weigh the benefits and the risks. And at this point, I don't see that the risks over, over weigh the benefits. And Pedro, you have a comment on that? Uh, yes, uh, no, no, I agree with Basil, but I think that the, the, the situation now is different because during the most difficult time uh, from, let's say, March 15 to <laughs> May 30, uh, we count on patients being sick or being ill uh, of uh, COVID. Nowadays, we count on positive cases of uh, PCR, most of them are totally asymptomatic and they will be uh, asymptomatic. And I think, in my opinion, uh, it's not a good option to delay six months or nine months uh, treatment. Uh, maybe one option could be in case of a positive asymptomatic patient to go on with the treatment and to freeze the embryos. And we transfer the embryos later on when uh, the, the patient will be totally free and, and with uh, her um, IgG positive, IgM negative, etc. But to say, uh, wait for six months, I think it's too hard because, as you said, Basil, uh, the mean age of our patient is between 38, 39. Uh, they cannot do six months. I thank you. And then now it's a question for Basil. Uh, which is uh, still related to what happened during ART stimulation. How would you handle a woman with imminent ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome who tested positive in COVID? Well, I think that's, uh, uh, that's a very challenging uh, scenario, but can happen if you do the test as we do uh, prior to uh, pickup. Uh, I think, uh, uh, number one, if still uh, possible, I would uh, definitely use the agonist triggering in an antagonist cycle, uh, collect the oocytes, and then freeze all uh, oocytes or embryos, depending on the status of the woman. Uh, because if you, uh, you do not do that, and you leave all those follicles there, she will have a high risk of developing OHSS, which on top of the COVID, we don't know what kind of consequences, you know, lung, abdomen. I mean, it will be a very, I think a very bad situation. And so far, I don't know if Pedro has seen any, I haven't seen any report of such a case. So uh, uh, apparently all of our colleagues we have been cautious. They use the antagonist and agonist triggering, which we know take, uh, eliminates practically the OHSS syndrome and then they could do with all the precautions that also Pedro showed, you know, if you have a, an infected patient, all the precautions in the operating theater, last to be, uh, to be treated, disinfection of the, of the whole uh, room after the end of the operation, collect the oocytes, fertilize them, and freeze them in the special tank. I think that would be uh, okay, my, my, my choice. I totally agree, Basil. And, and then uh, one question for Pedro. And then uh, when you speak about uh, freezing embryos, you speak about freezing embryos, then wait. But can frozen embryos have virus within them? Uh, there are uh, some publications, some very few, eh, showing that the virus could be present in sperm, and in uh, follicular fluid. But these uh, findings have not been uh, replicated by other studies. Uh, I'm not aware that, uh, that embryos, that, that it has been published that embryos could be infected. But I think that is a caution that we must consider. Well, if I may add, I fully agree with Pedro. And also, again, we need data, of course, but we can use uh, 
previous uh, experience, uh, for example, with H the HIV virus. And again, number one, it was never detected in a no site. Apparently, they say because it's a, a final cell or something like that, and and so on. And also, I don't I don't recall that it had been identified in the embryo. It's a different thing, the vertical transmission, but not because of the fertilization process. Pedro, do you have the same? Uh, same totally the same experience. Yeah. And uh, it, uh, with HIV virus, uh, it has been uh, published that was present in the sperm, of course but not in the old size nor in the embryo. Yes, yes, you know, but with the, with the COVID still we have to wait uh, of course. some time also because you have seen there are some data showing that they have found in neural cells, in adult individuals, in kidney cells, in neural cells, in different tissues, not only in the lung. Uh, yeah. Then we have, I think, to take the caution that you are taking now. Then a last question, is breastfeeding recommended? <laughs> It is. It, it is. is. As, as far as I know, the the, uh, the the publication I have seen, all of them agree. Although being uh, aware of the presence of the virus in the milk, the mother's milk, they said that the the, the balance between uh, benefit, risk and benefit was clearly in favor of uh, maternal breastfeeding, even in case of uh, COVID-positive pregnant patient. Okay. Then, dear friends, first of all, I would like to thank both of you who have participated to that beautiful webinar on behalf of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology and bringing us uh, some, in, not only the information, but bringing us the image, how the clinician take care of these growing problems, how the clinician, we are still ready to face the difficulty in human life who can suddenly appear with new situations such as COVID-19 pandemia. Then I would like to thank you, Pedro and Basil, for your time and for your devotion to the ISG Society. And then I would like to leave our public and to invite you to the next uh, uh, webinar Next webinar will be in Spanish. Will be not in English, will be in Spanish. And will be on uh, Otros Aspectos de la Anticoncepción. And we will have two fantastic speakers, Professor Cuatemoc Celis from Mexico and Professor Nestor Ciceles from Buenos Aires. Bueno, los invito todos a participar al próximo que va a ser en español. Va a ser un gran momento, una gran fiesta por el público español. Y creo que eso es indica un otro aspecto de la cara de la endocrinología ginecológica. Somos una familia grande, tenemos muchísimos idiomas, hablamos en inglés cuando posible, más el español, el francés, el italiano, el ruso, el chino, son todos idiomas de nuestro corazón. Gracias a todos y que tengan un buen día. Have a nice and good day and happy time and healthy life in this difficult moment. Thank you, Basil. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Thank to you all. Andrea. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye to everybody. Bye-bye, Basil. Bye-bye, Andrea and David.